Welcome to the Green Left Report, news for the 99%. I'm Mel Barnes. And I'm Simon Butler. Later this show, we'll report on the week-long community blockade against coal seam gas mining at Fortin Cove near Newcastle. And we'll show footage of the student protest that forced the university vice-chancellor to flee via an underground tunnel. We'll also talk about WikiLeaks and Ecuador with Julian Assange's mother, Christine Assange, and Green Left Weekly's Fred Fuentes. But first, some activist news. About 4,000 people rallied in Melbourne to save TAFE on August 16. The Liberal state government have cut $300 million from the TAFE sector. Hundreds of teachers and support staff have been sacked. Campuses are facing closure. Courses have been shut down. And thousands of students are facing fee hikes. 2,000 more jobs will go. TAFE staff, 2,000 people, will not be here this time next year. 200 people rallied in Sydney on August 17 to welcome Ecuador's decision to grant asylum to WikiLeaks editor-in-chief Julian Assange. Assange is the first Australian to be granted refugee status in another country. At the rally, City of Sydney Greens councillor Irene Doutney slammed the role of the British and US governments. Last time I spoke out in support of Assange, I said that I had concerns that he would be arrested the moment he tried to leave the Ecuadorian embassy. But I had not considered how heavy-handed the British police would be and how threatening their behaviour outside the embassy would become. The blatant intimidation of friendly diplomats is inexcusable when we consider the fact that Assange has not formally been charged with any serious crime. Assange spoke from the balcony of Ecuador's London embassy on August 19. He thanked those who showed their support after the British Foreign Office threatened to storm the embassy. But thank you for coming. Thank you for your resolve your generosity of spirit. On Wednesday night, after a threat was sent to this embassy and police descended on this building, you came out in the middle of the night to watch over it. And you brought the world's eyes with you. Inside this embassy after dark, I could hear teams of police swarming up into the building through its internal fire escape. Christine Assange has been a strong voice supporting Julian and WikiLeaks. She recently visited Ecuador to meet with government officials and supporters of media freedom. Green Left Report asked her about her trip. The thing that struck me most about the post was how warm and genuine the people were. And they all saw Julian and President Correa as being on the same path. For President Correa, they, they saw him as a brave leader who was defending participatory democracy and sovereignty in Latin America. And Julian, they saw as a brave editor defending free press. I had the lovely experience of meeting with the young people, the political young people from a wide spectrum of politics. They were very, very enthusiastic about Julian and what WikiLeaks represents because in their country they've been subjected to dictators who've been put there by the US. They've been subjected to a wide exploitation of their country and their people. I met a couple of people who'd been tortured, actually adults, prior to the Korea government coming in. And they were very hopeful about democracy in their country and very proud about what the Korea government is achieving with the people. Their participatory democracy, which is genuine, as opposed to the dead sort of democracy that we have to experience which just seems to be about self-interest. Then they swept to power as a new party and their platform was human rights, environmental protection and sovereignty. In 2008, they formulated their constitution, which was based on all those principles, and they took it back to the people in a referendum and the, the people gave it their support. And that was then followed by the 2009-2013 Development Plan for Good Living, which is a very exciting concept, quite a new paradigm for democracy. It's neither the left nor the right, but it is about protecting Ecuador's sovereignty, not influenced by the economic interests or military interests of other powers. Every single piece of legislation which goes through the Ecuadorian parliament has to go through a rigorous appraisal of its human rights values. And then there, of course, is the protection of the environment. And they have brought in special rights for nature. They would be condemned for this by 
other people that say, oh, you know, how can something so idealistic work economically? Well, it actually works very well economically. In the recession, where Western societies were experiencing economic collapse, Ecuador survived and thrived. It's got a 7.8% growth in its economy, and after five years in government, President Correa's government still enjoys 80% support by the people. Did people explain what WikiLeaks meant to them as, as people from South America, as in Ecuador, and the, the role that it's playing? They saw WikiLeaks as exposing what they'd known all along, which they couldn't get out to the outside world, that their countries had been exploited ruthlessly by the US. Their leaders had been removed and dictators had been put in, and they saw WikiLeaks that was primarily about justice and the truth. And Christine, just finally, I was watching Julian's speech that he gave on the balcony last week, and he started that off by thanking his supporters for coming out and defending WikiLeaks. I mean, in your opinion, how important was it that people actually get out onto the streets and publicly show their support for WikiLeaks at at times like that? Oh, it's extremely important. Um, We can't rely on the mainstream media anymore. I mean, you have exceptions like Phil Dawling at Fairfax Media, but generally speaking, the mainstream media is keeping a lid on what's happening with our democracies, what's happening to WikiLeaks, the persecution, the illegal frame-up of Julian by the Swedes and the complicity by the UK and Australia, the murderous witch hunt, really, by the US government. Because we can't rely on the media, which we should be able to line because they've become complicit with the powers that are trying to silence truth then we really only have the people and organizations such as green left who are operating independently and along with ethical lines to protect us from this this onslaught that we're experiencing at the moment is assault on, on our democracy and julian i actually was concerned that something would happen and i did put a tweet out please It's now time to take to the streets. Please protect the Ecuadorian embassy, and I'm sure other people are putting that same call out. And we're very grateful to those that turned up. We have to be our own media, it would appear, which is quite tragic. And we can't trust any more our democratic institutions or our governments to do the right thing. Terrific. Thanks so much, Christine. I was so impressed with what's happening in Ecuador, not just from the Constitution, but they explained to me that their success indicators are not GDP. Their success indicators are how any money that's made in Ecuador flows back to the people and to protect the environment and protect their sovereignty and the happiness of the people, the health of the people, their human rights record. These are the success indicators. Ecuador is actually proving that a democracy which is truly participatory that protects the environment and protects the people can actually work economically. That gives real hope because it actually works in practicality. It's not just a theory. It's a people's democracy, a true people's democracy. And um, I really recommend everyone have a look at that and see what they can take away from it. Great. Thank you so much, Christine. Okay. Thanks, Um. Joe. Britain's threat to invade Ecuador's embassy and Ecuador's decision to give Julian Assange asylum has become a huge issue in Latin America. Joining us to talk more about the implications is Fred Fuentes, who writes on Latin American politics for Green Left Weekly. Welcome, Fred. All right, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. First, let's hear from author and activist Tariq Ali. The changes began for social and economic reasons, it should be pointed out. The changes began when the people in Venezuela who were the first said enough, enough of IMF regulations, enough of World Bank rules, we don't like neoliberalism, we don't like the way our oligarchs are running this country, we don't want to live in a world where everything is privatized, where there are no public sector engagements. That is what started it off. There have been more elections in Venezuela than in any other country of the world since that time. Referendums launched against, won by the Bolivarians. A new constitution in which a population has the right, if it so wishes, to get signatures so that an elected president can be recalled way beyond the next election is due. And that Venezuelan model in different ways spread all over the world. It spread to Bolivia. It spread to Ecuador. It spread for a while to Paraguay, to Honduras. It had a huge impact in Brazil. And 
we don't have the world of the West now in many, many South American countries. So Fred, do you agree with what Tariq Ali said? Oh, I think very much so, and I think it's also very much the case why Assange went to the Ecuador embassy. Uh, it's very clear from the interview that Assange did with Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa uh, only a few months ago in Russia today, that he's very w well aware of developments that have been occurring in Latin America now for well over a decade. However, we've seen not just important protest movements, um, but movements that have taken a step further and actually taken control of the parliament of presidential power and using that power uh, to benefit the, the poor majority. So I think Assange was, was very clear very clear on that. That's why he chose um, the Ecuador embassy. Uh, but I think also Tariq Ali is very correct in the last point uh, he makes, um, which has to do about the West having much less less influence in there. And I think the whole, the whole episode of the Ecuadorian embassy is a very stark example of how it is that the so-called uh, democracy that the US uh, imperialism has supposedly been defending for so long is really just a farce where we see a, 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 a dissident from the first world basically having to seek refuge uh, in, the, in the embassy of a southern country in order to escape persecution, not just from the US, uh, but also one that's involved Swedish and Australian government as well. Mm. Fred, there's been an argument which is coming up more and more in the last mm. week or so, and that's the argument that Ecuador, Julian Assange, they're hypocrites because in Ecuador, President Correa is cracking down on the media and restricting free speech. Now, most of the people who say that don't know anything about the Ecuador political system or about the history. You do know a bit. So could you tell us, is that the truth? Is there any restrictions on, on the right to free speech in Ecuador? Oh, well, look, just as we saw the huge slander campaign against Julian Assange uh, when the WikiLeaks first released a cable that the cables were going to bring death and destruction to US spy officials all over the world and innocent uh, civilians will be killed as a result and you know where are they now uh, we've seen the same very uh, same campaign against the Ecuadorian government and it's very much based on you know false false information and the media knows that uh, using using that to discredit the Ecuador government what's happening what is the the controversy in Ecuador about the media? well look why, why are they upset it's because actually the Ecuadorian government along with the support of its people are helping to break down the media dictatorship that existed in that country just like in Australia where five, six, seven corporations control everything we read, see and, and read. And the same was occurring in Ecuador. And what you had was in particularly uh, sectors from the banking industry who ran television stations and never reported on what was happening in the banking industry even though there was a financial crisis uh, occurring there. Uh, so what did, what did the Ecuadorian government do? With the support of its people, it approved a new constitution that said, look, if you're going to own media, that's all you do, you own media. You don't have any conflict of interest by also owning so banks, by also owning It's very strict cross-ownership laws, really. Well, absolutely. It's, it's basically saying, look, just dedicate yourself to media. And when they do this, they say, oh, this is a, you know attack on freedom of speech. What's another attack on freedom of speech in Ecuador? Uh, well, it's when they ask them to pay the taxes. So when, these comp when the media corporations don't pay their taxes, and the government says, well, just like any other company, uh, we're going to have to close you down, oh, that's an attack on freedom of speech. Well, look, media is a, is a business. They make money from it just like every other one. They should be treated the same. And when they break the law, the government is willing to step in. So that's the real change. It's no longer the media that runs the country. It's actually the people in the government that are running it. And that's why the media corporations, not just in Ecuador, but around the world, are attacking uh, Rafael Correa. So, Fred, the new constitution makes provisions for community media. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, that's right. That's been one of the big debates that have been going on about the new media law, which is essentially trying to put the constitution into legislation. Uh, the new media law, uh, which again is uh, seen as another attack on freedom of speech, uh, what it says is that basically of all of the radio and TV frequencies, 33% will be private owned, 33 by the state, and the majority, or the biggest share, 34, will be by to the community sector. And that's what's been happening when these companies have been refusing to pay their taxes, refusing to pay their licence fee. The government says, well, we'll give you a warning, you don't do it, we'll shut you down, but they don't keep that frequency, they hand it over to a community to be able to broadcast. Uh, so the, the whole lie about the, the freedom of speech is really just an, a d defence mechanism for the media dictatorship that has maintained its power in Ecuador. There's been a few calls already in the US for sanctions to be placed on Ecuador. Do you think there's going to be much, much reprisals from the West, from US or Britain, against Ecuador? Well, look, I think the letter the British um, uh, government sent to the Ecuadorian embassy basically saying it was preparing to go into the uh, embassy was a very clear sign that they're you know, willing to do a lot. 
Uh, of course, what will ultimately depend on is the, the balance of forces. You know, at the end of the day, will they be able to get away with um, what they want to do? And I think the reaction that's happened globally, both from governments and also from uh, the peoples around the world, has forced the British to, to come back. So I understand that today they've put out a statement saying that, no, they will not uh, go into the Ecuadorian embassy. The Ecuadorian government has welcomed that um, as, an, as an initial step to be able to restart dialogue. But of course, dialogue couldn't continue as long as that threat remained of violating the embassy. Will sanctions come about? Look, it, again, as I said, it will depend on what happens globally with the support uh, for the Ecuadorian government and its uh, dignified position. Well, a lot of the other South American countries supported Ecuador's decision and they came out publicly um, about that. UNISOR came out and, and supported the decision. What implications does that have, do you think? Yeah, look, I mean, it's interesting that e even the Organization of American States, uh, which was, you know, traditionally set up by the U.S. as an organization it dominated uh, in Latin America, uh, was forced to pass a resolution in, in defense of Ecuador. I think really it's what it shows is that uh, the defense of Ecuador's sovereignty, that was really what was behind all of these governments coming behind Ecuador, beyond the, the decision that Ecuador decided to take about Assange. I think most governments take their own position on that, but they believe it's a sovereign decision of Ecuador to make. And once the, you know, the threat became... Um, open to the public that the British were willing to go into the embassy. This is why we saw this closing of ranks amongst all Latin American governments. They refer to it as, you know, the, the new Malvinas or the new Falklands War, um, you know, with the British, you know, attacking uh, Latin American country and that all of them had to unite uh, in order to defend Ecuador on this one. I'm sure that position will, will remain strong. Well, Fred Fuentes, thanks very much for joining us on the Greenleaf Report. And now it's time for some more activist news. Residents of Fortin Cove on the outskirts of Newcastle began a blockade on August 20 to stop Dart Energy from drilling two coal seam gas pilot wells there. The community blockade has lasted more than a week. Lock the Gate Alliance's Drew Hutton explain why the community is determined to win. Well, we've got about 30 or 40 people from the Fullerton Cove area just outside Newcastle. They've decided to blockade Dart Energy. Dart wants to come onto this property here to um, drill a couple of uh, wells, uh, pilot wells, um, as a prelude to setting up a gas mill in this community. This is a uh, fairly closely settled community. Um, if you went back behind our site here, you'd see that um, it's a very wet area and behind that there are Ramsar listed Westlands. La Trobe University Vice-Chancellor John Dewar ran from student protesters on August 26 during a protest about plans to cut up to 500 subjects from the Humanities and Social Sciences Department. Dewar fled via an underground tunnel. Students say he has refused to discuss their cutbacks with them. Mainstream politicians and the media routinely attack and denounce so-called people smugglers. But at a July 31 forum held by Sydney's Refugee Action Collective, former diplomat and author Tony Kevin said that the common myths about people smugglers put refugees' lives in danger. It's a fact that 97% of asylum seekers trying to reach Australia by unauthorised boat from Indonesia have got here safely. Now, who, who, who sent those boats? People smugglers. So if people smugglers send boats that get here 97% of the people safely, what is the logical conclusion one draws from that? Not that people smugglers are bloodthirsty monsters who send out boats and sink them as a matter of course. And now, Carlos Sands on Gina Reinhardt and her poetry. G'day, I'm Carlos Sands and this is my corner. Now, I don't want anyone to panic, but it seems like another key plank in Gina Reinhardt's plot to destroy this planet has been greenlighted. Yes, her proposal for a multi-billion dollar mega coal project in Queensland has been approved by the federal government, because that's what we need, more coal mines. As we face unprecedented Arctic melt, 329 consecutive months of above average global temperatures and a Sydney summer thunderstorm in August. More coal mines. We didn't need this planet, did we? I hope we have a backup plan. It strikes me that with Reinhardt, she is either the representative of a truly irrational social system uh, that cares about nothing 
accept the pursuit of profit even where that threatens the ability of the planet to be inhabitable for human life. Or she's part of a cohort of supervillains plotting our destruction because they are pure evil. Personally, I hope that she's a supervillain because when I'm confronted by growing evidence of an out of control climate crisis, I like to shake my fist and yell, Gina! That could just be me. Of course, all evil masterminds need minions. And so it was especially impressive that Reinhardt got the federal Labor government to approve this mine. This is the same government that includes Wayne, I love Bruce Springsteen Swan, who's always telling us about these greedy billionaires and how they wield far too much political influence. It actually begins to make me wonder whether or not uh, Gina has written and sent them another poem. I don't know if anyone read her first poem, but in terms of its influence on government policy, if anyone ever tells you that art cannot make social change, you tell them to go read Gina's poem. I'm going to read you a little bit here. It starts like this. The globe is sadly groaning with debt, poverty and strife, and billions are now pleading to enjoy a better life. What do they need, Gina? What will help them? Tell us. Their hope lies with resources buried within the earth and the enterprise and capital, which gives each project worth. So you're the saviour, Gina. She's doing this for the poor. She is such a philanthropist. So please, Gina, tell us how we can help you help the poor. She continues, develop North Australia, embrace multiculturalism, and welcome short-term foreign workers to our shores to benefit from the export of our minerals and ores. Now, it's not just the quality of the meter and rhyming structure. It is, the, it is the sheer boldness of her ideas that is so stunning. Here, she begins with an impassioned call to embrace multiculturalism and then in the same line defines it as her right to import cheap labour from poor countries to work down her minds for less wages and no rights. Personally, I was pretty much against this type of super exploitation until I heard Gina so cleverly rhyme shores with oars. But it's not just me. Even the federal government has proven they cannot resist her charm and her creative, her creative genius. Uh, even even the, the hardened class warriors of the Labour cabinet have, since that poem has been published, agreed to basically reintroduce a form of semi-slavery in the form of a, a guest worker visa along the lines that Gina spells out. So it seems to me either Gina Reinhardt is truly an evil genius or else Labour talks a load of crap and is in fact just as much in the pocket of the rich as the Liberals are. Bruce Springsteen or no Bruce Springsteen. I'm Carlos Sands. That was my corner. Thanks, Carlo. That's all for this episode of the Green Left Report. A big thank you to our generous supporters who helped us raise more than $40,000 in the past two months. We need your ongoing support to keep bringing you media for the 99%. But we still fell short of our $60,000 target. So if you were thinking of donating but hadn't got around to it, please consider helping us make up the shortfall today. Details are on screen now. Goodbye. Goodbye. Against the wall, the gift of life is no gift after all. And so, for this, the struggle must continue. The resistance will survive alive with a definite function, not for those with a definite.